going to look into the book of Titus in your Bibles. We have just started looking into this rather brief letter, three chapters as we have it, of the Apostle Paul writing to Titus, one of the young workers that he had that worked with him and served on his behalf as we've seen. And Titus is a man we don't know a lot about, but what we do know about him speaks highly of him. He's a man in whom Paul had great confidence. We looked into other portions of Scripture, particularly in 2 Corinthians. Paul had had Titus represent him in going to the church at Corinth, the church that had difficulties, that sometimes had doubts about the Apostle Paul and his ministry, and that Paul had confidence in Titus representing him, says something about the character of Titus. Paul's writing, and he's going to give him instructions about how the churches on the island of Crete are to be handling certain situations. Certain things have to be done, like the appointing of leadership, that will strengthen the church and enable it to confront some of the error that has begun to creep in. We don't know how the churches in Crete got started. We know that Paul visited there because in verse 5 of chapter 1, he says, for this reason I left you in Crete. So Paul had been in Crete with Titus, then moved on. And Titus was left to uh, deal with some of the things in the churches. The first four verses provide what we call a salutation, and it's a rather unique one for Paul. It's the longest of his salutations except for the book of Romans, and in this one long sentence, he unfolds some serious doctrinal foundation, some of which will be further dealt with in the letter. But we're reminded, Paul, when he writes letters, lines right up front, at the beginning, he doesn't hesitate to present sound, serious doctrine. He doesn't work his way into it. He talks about his position. He talks about uh, why he is writing. He talks about who he's writing to. Uh, Titus, he gives him a greeting. But he elaborates on his position, not because Titus needs reinforcement, although it will be a reminder to Titus, and all of us need to be reminded. And it will be an encouragement to Titus, because at Crete, Titus has to deal with some problems, just as he did when he represented Paul at Corinth. That takes some strength of character, that takes strength in the scripture. Problems don't infiltrate the church if they don't have a way of making an appeal to people and bringing confusion. Titus has to be one who can cut through that and effectively represent Paul because what Paul is bringing is the truth of God to these churches. It cannot be compromised. So we've looked a little bit at the introductory matters. Paul introduced himself right up front as they did in letters of the time, Paul. And he... Uh, identifies himself first as a slave of God. We have it translated bondservant. Uh, it's the Greek word for a slave, a doulos. Um, one who had no rights of his own, who was total under the authority of another, whose full responsibility is to carry out the will of the master. Uh, He calls himself a slave of God. Now, that is unusual. Usually, Paul refers to himself as a slave of Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ. But here, he calls himself a slave of God. He not only emphasizes that all his rights have been given up, um, he has none of his own. He only serves the one that is his master. But he says he's an apostle. And that gives him a a ministry of leadership, oversight, 
and bringing God's truth to the churches at Crete on this occasion and the man Titus as his representative. And we noted often in the Old Testament in coming into the New Testament, but slaves of God, servants of God like the prophets, like Abraham, like Moses, like different prophets we talked about, Daniel, Jeremiah, and so on, were also called slaves of God. And a slave was not only a position that could be viewed as lowly, um, because it had no, he had no rights of his own, and his will was to be the will of his master. But it was also a position of honor when you were serving a master of importance. But you came representing him and were to be respected and recognized in that position. And that's what Paul is as an apostle. He's acting as God's official representative. He has the authority to bring God's truth to these people. So it's important they understand. He's not here of his own will, <clears throat> of his own choosing. He serves his master. And he comes with a message from God and with the authority entrusted to him by his master as an apostle. It was recommended that uh, <clears throat> we put up on a slide the qualifications of an apostle that I mentioned last time. So let me just put that slide up, if you would. Let me say something about apostle. I mentioned these. I mentioned the verses. I'll look at a couple of these verses. Down to our day, there's misunderstanding on the gifts of the Spirit. Some of you are taking advantage of uh, one of the classes going on on Wednesday night on uh, gifts of the Spirit. When we get confused in these areas, it spreads and influences everything. Uh, there are certain qualifications that had to be met to be recognized as an official apostle. The first one that we noted was he had to be an eyewitness of the resurrection. In other words, he had to have seen Christ with his eyes after the resurrection from the dead. Um, come back to Acts chapter 1. I mentioned these references. Let me just look at a couple of them with you. In Acts chapter 1, they are, remember Judas was one of the original 12. The 12 were that group of Jesus' disciples that he appointed as apostles. That 12 becomes a recognizable group. Even after the death of Christ, as you move into uh, the book of Acts and the rest of the New Testament, the 12 remain that identifiable group. They are the center of authority for the church as it is established. Now Judas was one of those, Judas Iscariot. And obviously he betrayed Christ, went out and hung himself. So now there are 11. So in the book of Acts, they decide they need to replace that. The 12 is an identifiable group. So after talking about what happened with Judas in Acts chapter 1. Uh, Peter tells verse 21, Therefore it is necessary, Acts 1, 21, that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become witnesses with us of his resurrection. They have two men and the Spirit directs them uh, to one. And uh, he will replace Judas. So it's still the 12. And one of the requirements here is he had to have been with them. The baptism of Christ marked the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus Christ, remember. The Holy Spirit is seen coming upon him, anointing him as the Messiah of Israel. He begins his messianic ministry. So there are unique things about the little glimpse we have into his childhood, like when he was 12 and instructing uh, Jewish leaders. But uh, by and large, he's not performing miracles like the false gospels have, making clay birds and having them fly away and do things, because he doesn't enter his messianic ministry offering the kingdom of Israel till he's 30 years of age and baptized by the one who introduced him, John the Baptist. 
So he had to be with them and he had to be an eyewitness of the resurrection so that he could validate the resurrection of Christ. Um, the Apostle Paul is a unique one, but come over to chapter 9 of Acts, since you're in Acts, we'll take uh, these in authority. We're going to Acts chapter 15, I'm sorry. Acts chapter 9 is where Paul gets saved. And he sees Christ. That becomes key. So that will bring Paul as the 13th apostle, if you will. But he stands out as unique. The 12 will still be called the 12. But Paul is elevated to a level of the other 12. He's given an uh, opportunity to see Christ on that road, Damascus Road. And, uh, you know, we have to go back to Acts 9. I'm sorry. I'm confused. First time it's ever happened. Um, Acts 9 is where he sees Christ. Um, and then I want to leave Acts and take you to another book. Uh, but in Acts 9, as Paul is on his way persecuting the church, God breaks in on verse 3, and a light shines around him, flashed to the ground, and a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So that's, Paul gets a personal confrontation with the resurrected Christ. He would be able to declare by his own experience that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He is alive. So he could enter into that. While you're here in Acts, go to the next chapter, chapter 10. And Paul, uh, Peter, boy, it's going to be a confusing morning. I hope you're alert. Uh, Peter is sent to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile. And this will be the first time the Gentiles are formally brought in to be part of the church, which started in Acts chapter 2. And when Peter goes to the house of Cornelius, you'll note what he said. He talks to Cornelius and them in verse 34 and following about the life of Christ, then his rejection, then his crucifixion. Uh, verse 39, the end of the verse, they put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day, granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand. Oh, Why? Particularly, he centers out. These won't be the only people he appears to. We'll see in a moment. But to those of us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And uh, remember the disciples, they're fishing and then they see Christ and he sits down and has fish with them. Then they recognize him. He meets them on the road and he travels and he explains the scriptures and then they recognize him. They had these kind of experiences with him, appeared to them in the upper room um, in John 20 and those kind of things so that they could be eyewitnesses of his resurrection. Important. We are not eyewitnesses. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, his bodily resurrection. I believe it because of the testimony that has been written and recorded. And was based upon eyewitness testimony to validate it. So Peter claims that here. So they could be witnesses that he is alive. And that is a demonstration that his death on the cross paid the penalty for sin. Come over to Acts 15. And uh, I hope you like Acts 15 because we're going over to 1 Corinthians 15. <laughs> Will you believe I've been doing this for over 50 years? And it's been just as confusing on some times. We're going to Acts 15. Acts. <laughs> it didn't go any better the first hour. I told them I'd have it worked out by the time I got here. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul is writing a letter to the Corinthian church. And they had doubts about his position as an apostle. 
So in Acts chapter 15, verse 1. First Corinthians. If this keeps going on, we'll just have a word of prayer. And uh, don't say amen. Chapter 15, verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which you also received in which you stand, by which you are saved. So going on, and you'll note here, this will come up later in one of the points, <clears throat> Paul received a revelation. I delivered to you of first importance what I also received. And we'll see, he received it by revelation. Didn't get it from other sources. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to scripture. Then his appearances, which validated his resurrection. It just wasn't rumors that circulated. This is factual witnesses. He appeared to Kephas, then to the 12. You see the reference to the 12. They are identified as a group. Even before uh, Judas is replaced, they still have that identity. These are the 12. And uh, Judas was replaced as we saw in Acts chapter 1. Then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at once. So it wasn't just to the apostles that he appeared. But to be an apostle, you had to have an eyewitness uh, confrontation with Christ. After be an eyewitness, after his resurrection, you had to have seen him. Talk to him. Um, so there were 500 but that doesn't make, mean that the 12 are no longer the 12. So there can be more who are eyewitnesses than just the 12. But the 12 have a unique position and are appointed with authority as apostles in uh, providing the leadership oversight and foundation for the church with revelation given to them and the authority given them so that the church is firmly established on truth. So then to 500, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Note this, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. So Paul makes clear, I am one of the apostles. I am unique. I am born out of time. I wasn't born in the normal flow of seeing him after his resurrection from the dead in those 40 days, for example. No, he appeared to me in a special appearance in Acts chapter 9. And I think it's significant that he says, last of all, as the one untimely born, uh, he appears to me. Now later in the book of Revelation, John, one of the apostles, will see a vision of the resurrected, glorified Christ but Paul claims it was an actual, actual personal confrontation with the resurrected Christ on the Damascus road. So that qualified him to be an apostle. I say this because there are no apostles today. Um, this was one of the basic foundational requirements to be recognized as an apostle. You had to have seen Jesus Christ after his resurrection. Come back to... Uh, let me make sure first. Yes. Come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul's telling the Corinthians, because some of the false teachers come in, and to undermine Paul's message, they want to undermine Paul's character, Paul's authority. So he starts out chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? There are several things that go to be with an apostle, but one of the things is, I saw Christ after his resurrection. So he makes that one of the identifying marks of an apostle. And then in chapter 15, he said he was the last one in that line. So one of the books in my library by a professor that I had Wrote a book, The Thirteenth Apostle. And it's about Paul. Others have written with similar kinds of uh, titles. So Paul, the first thing is, you had to be an eyewitness of the resurrection. 
There could other things be said about that, but that's enough to make it known. Secondly, you had to be a, have performed miracles and miraculous deeds. Now, other people did some of these things. 500 people saw Christ after his resurrection. That didn't make him, make any of them apostles as well. Another one is to perform miracle deeds. That doesn't mean only an apostle could do it. But when you put the package together, this is what made and qualified an apostle. The appointment of God made an apostle. These are the things, qualifications that had to be met. You had to have performed miracles. If you're still in Corinthians, we'll just pick up with 1 Corinthians. Since as long as I stay here, there will be less chance I'll get confused. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Again, Paul writes a second letter to the Corinthians, same issue. The devil doesn't. I'm reading one of the Puritans that I like to read. And uh, he was saying, when the devil wants to destroy something, he attacks the leaders. That's where he'll start. And so it was there. Paul was appointed leader, but that pattern continues. Puritans writing in the 17th century. Um, but he said... Uh, you know, that's what you can look for. When division is going to be caused, attacks will be made on the leadership. Because when you undermine confidence in the leaders, we see that going on in our country. Leaders have been appointed by God, but the attacks on the undermine the character, undermine the confidence. That's what was going on with Paul. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he is defending his apostleship. And uh, he says in verse 11, I have become foolish. You yourselves compelled me. Actually, I ought have, should have been commended by you. For in no respect was I inferior to the most eminent apostles, even though I'm a nobody. But he was elevated to an eminent position as an apostle by the appointment of God. It's not anything to do with my worthiness. I'm nobody. But I don't come behind any of the apostles because that's what God did. He gives the one sack clear. But note what he says in the next verse. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs, wonders, and miracles. So that doing of the miracles was an evidence of his apostleship. Because here in line, he is claiming authority over the new church. He is claiming to have revelation from God that has to be the foundation upon which these new churches will be built. Remember Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20? The church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The revelation given to them. New Testament prophets he's talking about there. That's why apostles come first. Come back to the book of Romans just before 1 Corinthians Romans chapter 15. And here will be something that will lead us into our next section, our next qualification. At the end of uh, the book of Romans, verse 25 of chapter 16. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel. He didn't originate it. But it was revealed to him and passed on. It was revealed to others as well. But Paul claims direct revelation from God. We'll look at that in a moment. So my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for long ages past. Now, this is something not revealed in the Old Testament. But now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, who has been made known to all the nations, the obedience of faith. Paul received this revelation from God, and he will validate it by miracles. Back up now to chapter 15. Were you in 15? Did I tell you 15 or 16? We're going to 16. Now we're in 15. Boy. Verse 18, I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. So, and not putting down what God had done through Peter, John, and others, 
but I want to talk about what Christ has accomplished for me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, <clears throat> in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit. See, signs and wonders, they accompanied my ministry. And so what God had revealed to me regarding the gospel, and I have carried on, was validated by signs, wonders, and miracles. The truth of the gospel. It's interesting. Paul could have learned the gospel from Peter, John, the other apostles. They met with Christ. He ex explained it to them um, and so on during the 40 days after his resurrection before his ascension in Acts 1. But Paul always claims, I got direct revelation from God. Remember Galatians 1. It was revealed to him what we read in John, uh, chapter 16 of Revelation. It's my gospel. God gave to me. Uh, this is uh, why the third qualification, and you can put it up, because these, some of these go together. Uh, they receive direct revelation. And that's the connection of the miraculous deeds. They... Uh, he's an eyewitness to the resurrection. He performs miraculous deeds, not just to demonstrate he's special, but it validates the ministry. It's they receive direct revelation from God. Do you have that third point there? Um, somewhere. There it comes. Direct revelation comes quicker, but indirect revelation. Paul, so that's how these go together. He performed miraculous deeds. What does that do? That validates. When Paul did miracles, that's why he tells the Romans he hasn't been there. But he said, word of his ministry has spread. And you can, you know, check it out as I expect to come. But those who have been with me, those who know about me, know that miracles accompanied my ministry. And it was a ministry of truth. Come over to Hebrews chapter 2. Now, not everything in the New Testament was written by an apostle. The book of Luke, the book of Acts, written by Luke. He does not claim to be an apostle. He is not recognized in that sense. Um, he doesn't speak of doing miracles. He was a physician. But he wrote two inspired books. So you didn't have to be an apostle to write scripture. But these things together were required of anyone who would be an apostle. The miracle deeds, the eyewitness of the resurrection, and so on. We don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. There's not an author identified. Some believe Paul wrote it. Some believe Luke wrote it. Some believe someone else. But in Luke chapter 2, I mean Hebrews chapter 2, he talks about the, uh, God's salvation is revealed in the Old Testament, but it wasn't as clear and full as the revelation in the New Testament. The way of salvation, by believing the revelation God gave to Moses, for example, and so on, it was always by faith in what God revealed. But, <clears throat> verse 2, if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, that's the Mosaic law on Mount Sinai. New Testament tells us that angels were the inter intermediary that gave the Mosaic law to Moses on Mount Sinai. And the judgments for disobeying, that provo pre uh, proved unalterable, couldn't be changed. Every transgression or disobedience received a just penalty. <clears throat> How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, something of a superior revelation with greater clarity? After it was at first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard, God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. That's why I think uh, that it's questionable whether Paul wrote this. We just saw when Paul writes something, he claims his own authority as an apostle and the miracles he did. <clears throat> Here, this writer claims that the writings of the apostles were validated, but he doesn't include them. Uh, and God testifying with them, 
by signs, wonders. <coughs> Excuse me. We read in uh, Romans, for example, Paul claims his, his ministry was validated by signs, wonders, and miracles. But the point was, you see, it goes together with revelation being given. So these are three basic qualifications. That's why when you hear things today about, like a book I mentioned in our last study, New Apostolic Reformation, you have to be claiming the apostles. That gift has been revived as Christ bodily appeared, not just a vision, not a dream, but a bodily appearance that validates the resurrection. The miracle deeds that accompany their ministry. Direct revelation from God. Now I realize people come up. I attended a seminary where a prior professor, a scholar, has written a fine book on the prophets, was dismissed from the seminary because he claimed, I have the gift of prophecy. I have in my file things that he wrote to claim were direct revelation from God. So I'm not saying people don't come with these claims, but we must sift them carefully through the scripture. So when Paul, back in Titus chapter 1, claims to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, that's a position of authority in line with the other apostles, the 12, as they're known, and in the line of other slaves of God like Abraham, Moses, Daniel, um, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the other prophets that are called slaves of God. They're slaves, they have no will of their own, but they represent the living God and come with his authority as his slave. And Paul's is as an apostle of Jesus Christ. You'll know two things he's going to do here too. He's going to bring together God the Father and Jesus Christ several times um, in this salutation. You see something of the equality and involvement of all three members of the Godhead in our work of salvation, particularly here who will mention the Father and the Son. Their passages mention the Holy Spirit. It become evidences sometimes certain cults deny the deity of Christ. Well, it's... What passages? Well, there are passages that declare him as God. In the beginning was the Word, Word was with God, the Word was God in John 1. But there are passages that it's there. He's a bond slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. And you see Christ elevated there as being the source of Paul's apostleship of the one who is a slave of God. And three things said here. It's for faith, it's for knowledge, and it's for godliness. If I summarize those three things, what he is doing as an apostle, it's for faith, or the faith of those chosen. Uh, you know, I'm amazed as I read the salutation, we're just starting the letter. And Paul's right into serious doctrine. I mean, how long have these people been believers? And you remember, they didn't have their copies of the Bible, not even the Old Testament to carry around, let alone the New Testament that we have. Yet he launches right in as he identifies himself, and he says, this is for the faith of the chosen of God. And you know what the Greek word we carry it over in English, the elect. For the elect of God, as soon as you bring up the doctrine of election, today people go, no, oh, no, no. And they have strong feelings about it. Everybody who believes the Bible believes in the doctrine of election. Now, not everybody believes in it the same way. But you don't want to get in a position where you say, well, I don't believe in the doctrine of election that God chose. Oh, you don't believe the Bible? No, I believe the Bible. Well, he says, it's for the sake of those who are the elect of God. That I believe the doctrine of election. Now, we may not agree, um, but we're talking about those who have been chosen by God, that they might come to faith. That's what Paul's about. Remember, we read in um, Romans 16, he was carrying the gospel to the Gentiles. It was in 15 as well. 
That's his Isaiah. It's so people will have opportunity to hear the gospel, particularly the Gentiles. Not that the Jews aren't important, but God had sent him to the Gentiles. Peter Moore, the apostle, sent to the Jews in his specific ministry. Um, so that they could believe they are the chosen of God, uh, the elect of God. We'll get more into the doctrine of election uh, in our study of Romans on Sunday evening. Um, we get into chapter 9, but back up to 2 Timothy. I've got so many pieces of paper here, you would not believe it. 2 Timothy. Chapter 2, and we're going to verse 10. He's talking about his hardship, verse 9. Uh, it talks about his gospel, the end of verse 8, for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not in prison. Paul is able to keep his eye on the goal, the focus. Remember, the first responsibility is to know what my responsibility is. So here he is, having received a death sentence. He's in a prison as a criminal. But the word of God's not imprisoned. It's going out. We're testimonies to that. They executed Paul. Here we are 2,000 years later proclaiming the gospel that Paul preached. Uh, and not only not in prison, they couldn't contain it. Then you come to verse 10. For this reason I endure all things... For the sake of those who are chosen, there's our word elect again, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. Um, back up to uh, 2 Thessalonians, just before Timothy, the letters to Timothy, the letters of Paul to the Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Note the pattern here. Verse 13. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. Here you get a summary context. God did the choice. That goes back to the beginning. When you get to the beginning in Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. God had made a choice. He called them. He chose them from the beginning for salvation. How would this work? Through sanctification by the Spirit. The word sanctify means to be set apart. Same basic word for holy, be saint. God is holy because he is set apart from sin. So that holiness, that set-apartness, set apart by the Holy Spirit and faith in the truth. So you see, the two, first two things here are God's uh, action. He chose, that's what starts it, then the Spirit sets apart, then you hear and believe the truth. This is the package of salvation going on. Uh, it begins with God. It is his work. Uh, come to one more passage. Ephesians chapter 1. We're not going to resolve all this, but Paul didn't either. He wrote the letter to Titus. He just brought it up. Um, but he doesn't resolve it. Oh, well, God chose. Hmm. And look how he starts Ephesians. This isn't the end of the letter where he's explained everything. At the beginning, uh, verse 3 of Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless. We'll get to that in Titus in a moment. That happened before the foundation of the world. That's before Genesis 1.1. So in all of this mix, we agree. Before the creation, God chose from among some sinful human beings some who would come to salvation in Christ. And when he 
um, ordains the end, the salvation of some, he also ordains the means. It will be faith in the truth. So they say, well, what about if one of those he chose doesn't believe? Uh, the sovereignty of God assures that what he has planned will be accomplished. Now, people always say, well, well what about human responsibility? What about it? God is totally sovereign and you are totally responsible. Well, that doesn't make sense to me. Doesn't make sense to me either. I believe it because God said it. I mean, he says he is totally sovereign. He says, I'm totally responsible. If I have a solution, you sit here and say, maybe I'm not one of the elect. Maybe God didn't choose me. Maybe not. I wouldn't have chose you. I mean, maybe me. <laughs> no. It doesn't matter. He brought you here. What do you have to do to be saved? Become one of his. Well, you have to hear the truth. Why did he bring you here today? So you could have faith in the truth. Well, if I'm not chosen, I won't believe. Well, God says, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and order that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Believe in him. Call on him. Say, God, I'm a wretched sinner. On my way to hell, I don't think you'd choose me, but I'm calling on me, and you said you'd save me if I called on you. Here I am. What's the problem? Well, I don't think he chose me. What did he tell you to do? First responsibility is, know what your responsibility is. It's not to figure out what God did. It's to know what you're supposed to do. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. If you don't do it, whose fault is it? God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to the knowledge of the truth. He brought you here. You sit under the message. You hear you have to believe in Jesus Christ and him alone in order to be cleansed from your sin and made new. God is patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. Believe in him. Well, I, well you can't figure out God's... You know, you can't solve God's problems. What if I'm not one of the elect and I believe in Jesus? He'll have to save me. I guess so. But the very fact you believe in him will indicate that he chose you because you're such a wretched sinner. Without his intervening in your stubborn life and my stubborn life, none of us would ever be saved. But we'll leave the doctrinal election there since that solves all the problems and all the questions. But we will talk about it more in Romans 9 um, after we work through Romans 8. Come back to Titus 1. I just think it's amazing. Paul just assumes the believers should understand this. Because the Old Testament talks about the doctrine of election. God chose the nation Israel out of all the nations on the face of the earth. In fact, in Amos chapter 3 verse 2, he tells Israel, you are the only nation I have chosen for myself. So that doctrine is not a new doctrine, and that's just one example. Um, so it's not new. So he just launches in. It's not his major point. It's for the faith of those chosen of God, the knowledge of the truth. Without the knowledge of the truth, you can't be saved. That's why we present the gospel. That's why tra Paul was traveling the world, presenting the gospel to people who had not heard it. You know, we ought to understand this. There are no apostles today but the truth of the, uh, that was given to the apostles has been passed on to us. This is what we are to do. We've turned missions in this day into social programs. The scripture didn't do that. Men did that. You know, we have to come back. First responsibility is to know what my responsibility is. And I find that out from the scripture. It's what Paul's saying. He was an apostle for the knowledge of the truth. To bring the truth to people, the gospel. And the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it pierces into the most inner recesses of our lives. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And the word of God is a living word. Uh, come over to Peter. 
1 Peter, all the way toward the back after Hebrews, James, you're getting almost to the book of Revelation. 1 Peter, chapter 2. And he talks about this uh, area where we're going. Uh, our faith and hope are in God at the end of verse 21. Note what he says in verse 22. Since you have in obedience to the truth, the knowledge of the truth, and you hear it, you believe. How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without someone to proclaim it and tell them? As Roman 10 talks about. So you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls. That's what happens when you hear the truth of Jesus Christ and the salvation provided him and you believe it. Your soul is purified. Understand that. You are changed on the inside. We have people muddling around in this life and they're oppressed and they're depressed and they're confused and they're miserable. Jesus said he came to have, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. That's not the life he gives. Maybe the life someone's trying to live, but it's not the life that comes. He purifies the soul. So we love the brethren. We have a love for other believers. We are to fervently love one another. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. And in contrast to the beauties of this world, the word of God endures forever. That's his quote from Isaiah in verse 24 in the beginning of verse 25. The word of the Lord endures forever and this is the word which was preached to you. You understand that? Every time you share the truth of the gospel with someone, you are sharing the eternal word of God which is able to bring purification to their souls. Nothing else. Nothing else can do that. This is amazing. And we puddle around like, well, you know, it's just sort of making it through today. And we've been entrusted with this. Paul told Timothy in his letter, this is a treasure entrusted. Any wonder? There's nothing else that can purify a soul. You know, we have mental health professionals, but what can they do? One of the leaders on the news, a royal, he's been in therapy for years. That's not the answer. And the problems you have are beyond man's help. Um, you need your soul purified. The slavery to sin and the weight and the burdens and the mess cleaned up. That's what he's talking about. The word of God does that. So then chapter 2 goes on. Then you put aside all the sinful things that were coming out of that heart of sin. And like newborn babies, verse 2, you long for the pure milk of the word that you might grow in respect to your salvation. That's what Paul's talking about back in Titus. You hear the word of God. That's the beginning of a life. You didn't say, I trusted Christ. Now I'm just trying to get through Oh, we're doing more than that. Paul's in prison when he wrote 2 Timothy, and we wrote there, I'm enduring all things for the sake of those that God has chosen. They come to the life. I'm in prison while I'm still doing the same thing. I mean, you don't know my life is not that interesting. Make it interesting. Tell someone the truth. If someone found they have something to tell you, That will bring a cleansing to you that the greatest scientific discovery could never bring. It's more important than the cure to any virus infiltrating the world. It's a corruption that will send you to hell. But there is a cure. You can be purified on the inside. You don't muddle through life with an unbearable burden. You have a new life with a new heart. That's what Paul's saying. Uh, He was appointed by God as an apostle. That was the truth entrusted to him and the knowledge of that truth. And we continue to study it, to grow together, to mature together because we're like newborn babies and we take it in and we grow and we ought to grow richer in it, not weary of it. That's a danger signal. That's something all of a sudden, why am I, you know, become like Israel? Where God said, Israel, you count it weariness 
to worship me. You count it weary. I mean, what a terrible thing. I want the eternal God to say, you're tired of me, huh? No. It ought to be richer and deeper. That's what Paul's saying. This leads to godliness. That's the third point here he says, why he was appointed apostle. Carrying out his ministry of being a slave of God, doing his will. This is according to gospel. This produces God's character in a life. The fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace. You know, a long time ago, I quit talking to people. People want to come back and back and back and talk about a problem. But I'm a believer. And I started to say, let's look at the fruit of the spirit. I've talked to a number of people this way. And I said, look, fruit of spirit's love, joy. Walk through the spirit. And each one I'd say, and all the time we've talked together, I don't think this is a characteristic of your life from what you tell me. Peace. I don't think this is a characteristic of your life from what you tell me. Joy. I, I, I don't see that. Why should I why sit here and lie? Well, I think I'm a believer. I'm trying to be a believer. Well, God changes. That's his sovereignty again. Godliness is the result. Doesn't mean we never stumble. We all stumble in many ways, James wrote. But life is different. How could God come down and cause me to be born again, purify me on the inside, give me a new heart, cause me to be born into his family, make me a partaker of the divine nature so his character is producing me, and my life still just plods along. It's, well, you know, it just doesn't go anywhere. Something's wrong. And I have to back up and be honest. I have to admit, I have helped some people leave. Not everybody leaves because of that, but sometimes you tell them, I don't think you're a believer. I mean, you're telling me a lie. The Bible says if you don't love the children of God, but you say you love God, you're a liar. If you say you are a child of God and you're living for the devil, I mean, you want to help people. It's like somebody who's sitting at an oncologist, I don't uh, Office filled with cancer, and he's telling the oncologist, I feel good. Don't tell me I have cancer. I know my own body. I'm feeling fine. Well, but look, here's the x rays, and here's, doesn't matter. I feel good. That's the way people are. Here, let's look at the x ray machine. Ah, oh, it's not looking good. You know, this is where Paul is. So much theology, just as he starts this salutation, he hasn't gotten out of the first sentence yet. We can't get it in in two sermons. Uh, it's in the hope of eternal life. That's what he's doing, bringing life. What did Christ come to do? I am come that you might have life, and you might have it more abundantly. I mean, there's a rich life he gives. I mean, the spirit comes and takes up residence. This is eternal life. Oh, uh, I don't know. Well, it's God who cannot lie who promised it. And I love it. We've uh, translated it long ages ago. But you note in the margin of your Bible, the literal translation is before times eternal. I mean, you can't get any farther back than that because all the further back we can go is in the beginning. God created the heaven and the earth. But before time's eternal, he promised. Remember we saw in Ephesians 1, this was back. This is the plan that God did. And he can't lie. It's part of what he promised in the pack of salva package of salvation he prepared for me. I have eternal life. He that has the Son has life. You don't have the Son, you don't have life. No wonder you're struggling. Quit pretending. Give up. I mean, we have the reality. This is not just happy, happy, happy. But Paul could be in prison and be content. Um, be excited about what God had promised for him. He knows his execution is impending. And still not be depressed, discouraged, disillusioned. Why? We have the hope of eternal life. I've entered into life in Christ and it will never end. Because I may experience physical death, but I'm coming back up again. We sang the song, Anastasis. Uh, it was at the proper time manifested. God planned this before he created. 
but at the proper time he manifested it. Even his word in the proclamation of which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior. Now what? God planned an eternity past, but now it's been fully revealed. That's what Paul's saying. It was revealed with the coming of Christ and how this would all come together and be provided. It's his word. We have that. It's real. Is it real in your life? His word. This is what I was entrusted with. This is the treasure he raises. Guard that treasure which was entrusted to you. It's according to the commandment of God our Savior. And you'll note down the end of verse 4. He talks about it's from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Brings God the Father and God the Son together. They are together in our work of salvation. We can know from other passages, the Spirit's work who now indwells us. Christians walk along, no, life is so hard, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know, maybe I need a pill. Maybe I need a drink. Maybe I need to look into the mirror of the Word and say, is this me in here or is this a make-believe? Is this a counterfeit? Is this a phony? Is this a pretender? I don't know. I can't see your heart. You can't see my heart. Everybody looks about the same, relatively. I mean, you know, but where are we? Where am I? You know, sometimes you have to close the door in your bedroom or wherever you're private and say, Lord, where am I? I'm frustrated. I'm disappointed. I'm going to settle this. I'm either not your child or I'm your child muddling around in disobedience. I'm not letting you produce in me what you say you produce in your children. I'm going to settle this. There were times I went through more than once. Lord, I'm settling this. I know I settled it two months ago, but it didn't settle it. First of all, let's settle. Am I your child? I have no other claim, but Christ died for me the best I can. I'm putting my faith and trust in him. I want him and him alone to be my savior. I want him to be the master of my life. I'm yielding. I'm giving it up. Now I have to go on, Lord. You know, only so many times I do that, I tell you, God promised he cannot lie. That's our hope. That's why you spend time looking at this. This is the book that cannot lie because it's God's word. You realize it was passed down to us. You have it. I have it. The God promised who cannot lie. Um, I don't want to lose my grip on that. He's writing to Titus, my genuine child in a common faith. Grace and peace. Peace with God and the peace of God. Because it comes from God. And from Christ Jesus, our Savior. I mean, did that get any better than this? Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are operating on my behalf for my benefit to bring about the development of my salvation, beginning with faith. In the ongoing growth, that I might serve him as my master and manifest his character in my life of godliness. And that's just a salutation to get the letter going. Because already these Crete churches are beginning to muddle and wander and being open to other things that confuse them. The devil is a God of confusion, small g. The Lord is clear. His word is clear. He gave it to us. He gave the Holy Spirit. The world doesn't know. They don't have the Spirit. But we have the Spirit of God. We can understand. Not because we're special in and of ourselves, but because we belong to the God who has made us his special children. So the word of God is clear. It is encouraging. It is exciting. And we want to live it. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your word, for its power, for all that are provided. More than words on a page, but words that are alive and powerful. 
Lord, the words that transform us when we really believe what you have said. Believe that you are a God who can be trusted. We let go of everything else and place our faith in you and you alone. Claiming what Christ did for us is our only hope, as our forgiveness, as our redemption. And then, Lord, live, begin to live the life that you have planned for us. May that be true of each one here. You know us as we are. You see our hearts. There is no hiding from you. Pray the Spirit will use your word in each of our lives. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.